Should I go? Hey, Graham, would you... Uh... How did you meet Stuart and what do you think? My people are so over the moon, honey. Oh, good. They are just reborn. Well, good to have them here. There's your dinner party, your lunch partner, Kira Orange Jones. So. Let her come in and then we'll yeah. start. So Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Walter Isaacson. It's a great pleasure to kick off this combined meeting of all the Aspen Global Leadership Network as well as uh, many leaders from many other groups that we combined as well as some of our trustees and supporters of the Aspen Institute. I can think of no better way to start than with Linda Resnick, partly because Linda, through the Aspen Institute and the people she's met there, have hit a few inflection points in your life and actually, at a certain point, I think, done what we always try to do at the Aspen Institute is help people move from whatever success they've had to being significant, to trying really hard to uh, be part of something larger than themselves. So why don't you describe how that happened here? Well, um, there, was, there was one night, and forgive me if some of you have heard about this before, but uh, it was a seminal moment in my life. Uh, we were invited to a dinner party, Stuart and I, in the summer. It was about four or five years ago, and it was at Jeannie Rohatton's house. Her mother's here, Jan Greenberg, and I said, do you mind if I bring Michael Sandel? Now, uh, how many in the room know Michael Sandel? He's one of the greatest teachers at Harvard. and his class, he teaches about ethics and justice in society. And uh, he has, I tease him that he has a lounge act. Mm -hmm. Because in his lounge act, um, if he comes to a dinner party at your house, he might ask you very, very poignant questions about how you feel about certain things. And um, that particular night, we were talking about water torture and how we felt about torture. Uh, because. It was very much in the news that summer. And of course, the men kind of were for torture, and the women were totally against torture. And um, are you shocked? You thought it was the other way around, right? So uh, on this particular night, as we talked about torture, um, they said, but what if it was the future of your child? Or what if you knew you could save people? Uh, because a bomb was about to go off, and all these pointing questions that really made you think about your flippant answer maybe wasn't exactly how you felt. And then he told the story of Amalek, and I don't know if any of you have ever studied that, but he said, what if you lived in a town? And in that town, uh, everyone was happy. Uh, people that wanted to be married were married, and they had beautiful children, and everyone had a job, and everyone was healthy, because if you did, you had to leave the town. And that made me think. And when we were finished that night and we got in the car, I said, well, I could never allow even one child to be tortured. And my husband, Stuart, turned to me and he said, but the child is being tortured, Linda. What are you doing about it? And it changed my life that very day. But I would never have met Michael Sandel, and I would have never thought the deep thoughts that I hope I think today, if it weren't for Walter and his leadership in the Aspen Institute. Well, the Aspen Institute was a, let Stuart stand up too, because Stuart and Linda, as uh, Stuart helped do, uh, are the uh, great agricultural landowners, pistachios, almonds, pomegranates, and things. And that got you involved in uh, the Central Valley of California, both in terms of education, but also helping the valley. Why did you choose that? Well, uh, we're the largest uh, employers in the Central Valley. And 
look, there's poverty and sadness all over the planet, but I felt that if I was really going to do work, I should start to do the work in the place where our employees worked and live. That that would be the most meaningful. People don't know about the Central Valley. It's 44,000 square miles. It's the whole lung of California. It's, and nobody there can breathe. And, um, and it's also the place that your fruits and vegetables come from. So, uh, and we have trees in the Central Valley that grow the crops. And we have so many workers there, um, I think 5,000 at this point. So it made sense to start in the Central Valley Why for me. Why didn't you start with education? I didn't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I started uh, in a small town called Lost Hills. <laughs> We're going to stand up, but we have some resident scholars here. Lost Hills. That's Alicia Hickson. She's <laughs> part of our success, let me tell you. We started in a little town called Lost Hills, 2,500 people, 41% of the households work for um, our company, one of our companies out there in the valley. And um, they had no street lights, they had no gutters, they had no sidewalks, they had no life. They, they didn't talk to each other, they were in their houses because it was too scary at night without lights on the streets. The children had no place to play after school. And so uh, we went in and we built a beautiful park, a 10 acre park and soccer field and uh, basketball court with lights and a fabulous community center. But those are just buildings, that's just brick and mortar. Um, but Alicia, we found Alicia who was running the Family Resource Center there and she's been a, such a great partner. And we partnered with the people in Lost Hills. We didn't just go in with a preconceived idea, we went in and asked them door to door, 40 minute interview with every household except for the two meth labs. We didn't go there. Yeah. We <laughs> and, and we, um, what do you want? What do you need? And they told us and so we, we did it, but I realized after a while that nothing was sustainable unless we started working on education, so that's how. What, what are you doing in particular that excites you on education? Well, um, we impact about 38 schools with uh, school grants and things like that. We give um, 100 scholarships a year to kids, but um, it's our charter schools. We have a preschool and a high school. and um, that's very exciting. I try to work through the public school system though because the 38 schools that we impact are public schools and no change in the Central Valley is ever going to happen unless we work with public schools. Um, but we started a new program called Career Tech which is really exciting. Noemi Donoso is here. She's our head of education. She has a lot of, stand up for a second and let everybody see you. Hey. <laughs> and, um, Oh, I just dropped my whatever. So, uh, I hate when that happens, don't you? Yeah. So, uh, we realized, um, John Daisy years ago asked me to sit on a panel for NBC about education. I said, I don't know anything about education. He said, but you know about jobs. And so, I started asking the people that run the various uh, divisions of our company how jobs how were they finding the right people? What I heard was alarming, that they were going offshore for things that they should have been doing in America because they couldn't find people with an education to do them. That, uh, they, that our farming operation had to put people through 12 weeks of training in order to put them in a middle management job uh, on the factory floor. And that we were not training people for the jobs that were available. So in the Valley, what we're doing is, uh, and it will start in 2014, I hope to come back someday and tell you it worked, is that um, uh, we have identified kids that want to go on the, uh, the ag track. Ag is not what you think, it's not picking fruit anymore, it's computer scientists, it's uh, pest management, it's water conservation, it's all, you know, it's a business. and. Um, we will take them through high school. When they finish, we've partnered with Bakersfield College, Sonia's here, yes, <laughs> and uh, West Hills College and two high schools. And these kids, when they finish high school, they will have two years, they will have an AA degree, and they can either go into middle management at one of our companies, uh, or they can go on to a four-year school. Have you talked to John Dacey and others about this skills 
to the workforce type uh, thing that we used to do in our high schools and community colleges, but we've gotten away from? Yes, but probably not enough. <laughs> Where's John? He's right here. Oh, hey, Daisy. <laughs> All right. Daisy is, as most of you know, head of the LA Unified School District. And it is an issue of uh, not training the right skills now to get to the workforce. So it'd be good if we could learn from how that worked. Do you worry it's July now that it's three, two and a half months off or whatever, that kids uh, in Lost Hills or anywhere kind of lose so much in the summer months? And that's where a divide comes in, where kids from you know, more privileged backgrounds probably have enriching summers. And um, maybe in the Central Valley, they're losing <coughs> some of the learning by having two and a half months off. It's not just the Central Valley. It's all, well, you yeah. know, it's all of California and probably throughout the nation. What happens to these kids if they have no, no stimulation during the summer months? And by the time they're in the fifth grade, the children in poverty that have not had uh, summer school can be two to three years behind by the fifth grade. And preschool is just as alarming what happens. So um, I wish I knew the name of that um, YouTube video, but there is one about the lack of education during the summer. And if you can find it on YouTube, it is startling and horrifying to see what happens. We have six summer schools going uh, this summer in the Central Valley. Next year, we hope to have 12. And we're going to keep going because uh, that's at least something that we can do in many, many schools. Well, obviously, the notion of a nine-month year for schools started because of agriculture. People needed to be off in the summer and the harvest. Does that hold true in the Central Valley still, or is that just totally an outmoded concept? Well, the children uh, don't work anymore, thank God. <laughs> We've stopped that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was something kind of wonderful when the kids were allowed to work with their parents, but it was also not great in many other levels. And so what happened when children were not allowed to work anymore, they did nothing in the summer. Now our summer schools are overbooked. Um, it, We've been doing summer school for a while, but we never had this many as we had this year. And uh, enrollment is huge, so it's not an issue. You know, uh, people sometimes say, we were in one of the round tables, about the whole system of public education just being broken beyond repair. Have you gotten more optimistic or pessimistic as you looked at it? There are days. <laughs> um, but of course, I'm an optimist, or I wouldn't be able to make it through the day, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm hoping for two things. Uh, one of the things that I, I think really can make a difference is empowering the children and their parents. Um, I, I really believe in this, and I, I've had a first-hand experience. It's just one experience, but the charter school that we have in the Central Valley, uh, Noemi and I had nothing to do with until about six months ago. And it was failing uh, miserably. And uh, there was a great deal of animosity towards a charter school in our district. They didn't, you know, we take money away from the public schools, quite frankly. And so they, they didn't want us there. And so because our grades were so bad, they were going to close us down. And so um, I did something that terrified me at the time. And, but Noemi gave me strength. And we had a town hall meeting with the parents of the kids, the teachers. And I told them the truth. I, put, I made huge signs and I said, this is what Delano Public School is doing. This is what Cesar Chavez School is doing. And this is what you're doing. And you're 200 or 187 points below. And they are going to close our school. You have four months to get it together. You have four months. I only need a seven point gain. They gave us a 60 point gain. Wow. Now, how do they do that? Noemi slept on the floor of the uh, <laughs> gymnasium. <laughs> they got no Christmas. They got no Easter holiday. They worked after school. They worked every weekend. And we rose our scores, our API scores, 60 points. And I, it was just an example of here are the customers, the kids. They don't know what's going on. I, I did 10 focus groups in John's schools. He was so nice to let us in. And 
we, they said to me, why are our best teachers fired? They had no idea. They wanted to blame the principal. They wanted to blame the president of the United States. They wanted to blame John. They, they didn't know it was the teachers union, last in, first out. Kids don't know. They have no idea of why they're suffering Explain the way they are. Explain last in, first out. Well, the teachers union in, in uh, Los Angeles, at least, um, the last to arrive could be the greatest teacher you've ever seen, but they're the first to go. So you're laid off on lack of seniority. And budget cuts, which we've had hideous. I mean, okay, George so talk about the budget cuts. You've been very involved in politics in California. You're friends with the governor. Uh, are things, why is uh, California, which was the best educational state 30 years ago, doing a shooting itself this way? Well, there was Proposition 14. Is that what it was, John? 13. I always get my numbers mixed up, which is why I don't have a checking account. Anyway, um, uh, and, uh, and that, that put a lot more money in people's pockets, but it took out, you know, we have people that have mental illness on the streets, and we have children that aren't being educated. We are 47 out of 50 in uh, what we pay per child. What is it today? 4,900. Uh, no, 49th out of 50? No, 49th out of 50. So it's 58 or... Mississippi or, or Louisiana? Oh, good. Mississippi. Not okay. Louisiana. And we have... And 47th, 47th in class size, right? The average class size is 45 to 50 kids. Why? I mean, what... what because, what? you know, and, and the kids said to me, why? We told them. Did, we, did you lose control of the narrative in California about how the state had been built with a great public school system and a great uh, university system. You know, I'm not really an expert on this, but what I told the kids and what I, what I tell them is that the adults made choices. They made choices to put money in their pocket rather than support the schools and things like mental health and other health programs. And so uh, you're right, the narrative has been lost. I think Jerry Brown is very supportive to education, especially uh, secondary education. But he just gave us a billion dollars, right? Yep. Uh, not John and I personally, but uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, for our what do you schools. Mean by that? He he put a billion dollars back. You know, In we lost education. two billion. He put a billion back, and that's helping schools quite a bit. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they've learned how to tighten their belts, but how do you teach kids when there's 45 or 50 kids in a classroom and their best teacher is crying that day because she was fired? How, how do you do that? What else are you doing in Lost Hills or the Valley that sort of surrounds education to make it more holistic? Well, one of the things that we're really uh, proud of is uh, that we give free health care to the people that work for us. So it. Even if you have health insurance in the Central Valley, by the time you drive an hour and wait in a clinic for an hour and a half or two hours or three hours to see a doctor, and then the pharmacy's closed, it doesn't matter what kind of health care you have. So we've set up two clinics so far, and we're going to be doing it at all of our factories, where the employees and their families get all free testing for mammograms mm. and you know, diabetes and every test you can think of. And then if they need, and there's a doctor on staff that comes once a week, but there's great healthcare providers, that practitioners and so forth, that are there every day. And all the immunizations are free. And so the whole family uh, can take advantage of this. And if you need medicine, you get it at a discount and it's delivered within 24 hours to your workplace. And we've already saved some lives. I mean, it's, it's thrilling. What, what motivated you to start doing all of this? You know, it's just luck and privilege mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm able to do this. I know a lot of people that are a hell of a lot smarter than I am, and they work a lot harder than I do. But I just had the luck and privilege to be born in a family that could put a roof over my head and that could uh, feed me and send me to school. And so I realize that that is my obligation as a human being on this planet to give back as much as I can. Yeah. Um, but is philanthropy in your mind just something that privileged and the wealthy should do, or is there a way to spread philanthropy to being totally part of our system at all levels? 
But it is because the people, we, we have something called role giving where we give $1,000 to every employee to give to any nonprofit that they want to uh, through the year. And then we give matching up to $10,000 for executives and so forth. But the people that give the most and that work the hardest to find a place to make a difference are the people that have the least. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we've done fundraising for a tsunami and 9-11, I mean, people would come out of the fields with change in their pocket and, and give it. So this feeling of philanthropy, I think we have to do much more on a higher level <laughs> of Wall Street and so forth. I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, then, um, then the people that really understand because they're in such need themselves. Those are the most giving people that I've ever met in my life. And do you get like a large percentage of people that roll your company giving philanthropically because of that? I, well, yes, um, they do. And uh, they're inspired by it, but they also teach us a lot. And the reason we do this is because in the small communities around America where we are, people know what the issues are, whether they need uh, you know, new soccer uniforms or they need uh, to plant trees in a certain park. We would never know that, uh, but our people tell us. And then. The amazing thing is that we find out about things because you know, people in the Valley have told us, oh, there's a great need here, and then we can go in and help. So it's been, it's been a two-way street, and it's, it's really um, inspiring. Well, let me end with the fact that you and Stuart, right at the very beginning, when we said we have to bring back all of our young leaders uh, and give a chance to turn thought into action, and created this action forum, you not only leaped on it, you helped shape what it was, became the major benefactor. Why was this important to you, and why did this catch your attention? Well, first of all, you asked me. <laughs> Peter did. <laughs> and so uh, you don't ask me that much, so I figured this is really important to you. It is. I, I was lucky enough, I think, two years ago to come and hear some presentations and help model uh, mm. you know, the pitch with people, which was very inspiring to me. But I'm a thousand times happier now that this happened than I was before I've really had an opportunity to meet all of you and hear some of your stories. And I'm very grateful to you once again, Walter, for giving us an opportunity to help. Well, we're grateful to you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Stuart. Jim Pickup, uh, there, I was talking to a couple of you here, uh, Israeli and Palestinian tech entrepreneurs. Jim uh, works at the Aspen Institute and many other places, but the coolest thing he does for us is the Middle East Investment Initiative and all the Middle East programs that are really um, trying to find, as people in this room would understand, that if you can get entrepreneurs and business leaders to work together, in the Palestinian territories, Israel, throughout the Middle East, it can lay the foundation for peace. So those of you who I talked to, who I said you really got, got to get involved in the Middle East programs, I took all your cards, but actually come talk to Jim later. Jim, pick up. Thank you. There you go, Chief. Just a couple seconds so we get situated up here. Well, let me just start real briefly while, while we get seated. Um, just uh, not even a full month ago, the Aspen Ideas Festival was held here, and there was a full track devoted to the Middle East um, and really its importance uh, to the world in, in geopolitical terms. Um, you know, we, we see daily uh, the, I don't know if it's implosion or reorganization or whatever you want to call it in Egypt. We see vast war and destruction in Syria. Uh, we see the possibility of uh, maybe renewed peace talks in, in the Palestinian territories and, and Israel. But often uh, a lot of these discussions obscure um, a, a broader uh, understanding of, of what's going on in the region. 
Uh, and that is really uh, one of, uh, of opportunity. Uh, there are, yes, there are challenges, but there are um, really is a lot going on that, that we, we forget about when we, when we watch the nightly news. Um, it's also important to realize that a lot of those discussions that on, on population growth and others actually underpin a lot of the political dynamics that are going on, certainly. We have three fantastic uh, uh, fellow fellows here uh, to, uh, to discuss this. Um, Dima Bibi is the Chief Executive Officer of INJAZ, a leading Jordanian youth organization and a member of Junior Achievement Worldwide. INJAZ is an independent nonprofit organization established in 1999 with a mission to inspire and prepare youth to become productive members of the society and succeed in the global economy. INJAZ today delivers its wide array of programs through a network of around 4,000 qualified volunteers from the private sector, and with the support of more than 300 corporations, its partners from the public sector and the civil society, promoting business entrepreneurship, social leadership, and essential business and interpersonal skills. Uh, Dima is based in Jordan, and she is a member of the inaugural class of the Middle East Leadership Initiative. Um, to my, my far uh, left, uh, Ghassan Hasbani is from Lebanon and the pres uh, president of Saut uh, Foundation for, uh, they do a lot of work in um, education and healthcare development in Lebanon. He is also the former CEO of the International Operations Group of Saudi Telecom Company. He joined Saudi Telecom from the global management consulting firm of Booz & Company, where he led the firm's Middle East communications and technology practice. He's a fellow of the second class of the Middle East Leadership Initiative. And finally, to my immediate left is Yoav Ventura, a successful entrepreneur and local thought leader in higher education and human capital management. He is the Vice President of Planning and Strategy at, the, uh, at University of the People, the world's first tuition-free, nonprofit online academic institution dedicated to the democratization of higher education. Yoav is also the co-founder and managing partner of AKT, which he has led since 1999. AKT is a leading human capital management firm executing a vision of comprehensive talent management and strategic human capital development. Yoav is from Israel and is a member of the second class of the Middle East Leadership Initiative. So first a caveat, um, we, the Middle East is one of the most diverse regions in the world and so to lump it all together, which we're sort of going to do in this conversation, um, is, is a little bit of, of, uh, of a fiction. Um, you know, it's sort of like uh, uh, George Bernard Shaw used to say about the, the United States and England. They're two peoples divided by a common language. Um, and the, the Middle East is very much sort of that times 10. Um, so I'd like to start, you know, first with Ghassan. Um, maybe if you could set the scene a little bit and describe this, this broad region, um, and hopefully maybe not in terms of what we're watching on the news every night, but, but give us a little bit of depth. Thank you. This region spans, contrary to what people might think, spans multiple cultures, uh, geographies. In fact, uh, at least two continents um, and a, a huge and diverse population, be it, as I said, culture, be it even religion, um, and also ethnicities. So I would guess today that our coverage of Middle East would include the North African part of the Middle East, which covers a bit of Africa, the Gulf, um, and uh, the Levant area, Iran, and Turkey, the extended Middle East. And if we look at this entire geography, it encompasses nearly 400 million uh, people living there. But what's fascinating about it is the growth rate of the population of, of, of that geography. It grows by about 8 to 10 million people every year. You can imagine the number of youth in, in this kind of uh, uh, growth situation. At the same time, 30% of this population is between the ages of 15 and 29. That's also a, a massive number compared to more stable uh, economies. Interestingly, I would divide the region into kind of two parts. One is kind of Western Asia. That's the Levant, Iran, and, and Turkey. The other is the Gulf. In the Western Asia part, 85% of the youth 
of the population, of the youth population, is actually unemployed at this point in time. While only 15% of that population is unemployed in the Gulf. So you can see that the poorer or the lower growth countries in terms of GDP have also an employment issue with this youth population. If we look though at the growth that is not related to oil growth, today as it stands in the current global economic crisis, it's around 3.7 to 4 percent, which is not too bad considering what's happening to the rest of the world. It's just half of that of, of the growth of, of China. So effectively what that paints to us, a picture of a great opportunity for growth, for economic development, uh, for education, for investments. But at the same time, it comes with a set of massive challenges related to youth unemployment predominantly, which is also related to education. And that can help explain a little bit what is happening currently in parts of the region in terms of the economic indicators that are leading a large portion of the population to look for significant change. And it's actually happening now. And that change by itself should, in one way or another, if it's managed properly and looked after properly by the concerned parties around the world, should result in a significant opportunity. Absolutely. Um, Dima, you do a lot of work with youth uh, in Jordan. Um, when we were talking beforehand, I found it fascinating a lot of work you've done in sort of looking into the youth perspective of this. I think it's very easy to say, well, we've got a youth bulge, and, and so therefore what we need to do is, is educate them or finance them or whatever it is, but you've actually been talking to them. So, so what do they want? What are, the, what are they talking about in the region? Yeah, uh, dealing with youth uh, for the past 13 years uh, on a daily basis, we, I just want to share uh, one thing that I believe is extremely interesting. Youth this year, specifically this year, are much more optimistic than I've ever seen them before. They're very uh, much hopeful. Uh, and if youth who constitute more than 70% of the Arab population are hopeful, I, I believe we as well should be hopeful. Uh, there are a lot of surveys that were conducted in the Arab region uh, on youth and on uh, what they believe uh, their concerns are and what their priorities are. Um, one of the uh, most comprehensive uh, surveys is the Asda uh, Burson uh, Marsteller, which highlights specific uh, findings. One of them is that the youth today, for them, the number one priority is employment, finding jobs, and is fair pay. Um, and that um, survey was done on 15 Arab countries. Uh, their number one concern or their um, most pressing issue and concern is the rising uh, cost of living and their inability to form families and, and rent houses and so on. Uh, and their, um, their number one uh, uh, cause of um, or belief, the biggest uh, obstacle hindering the growth in the Arab world, they believe, uh, is the lack of democracy. Uh, in addition to the civil unrest, followed by the Arab-Israeli conflict um, and the, um, the uprisings that are, are happening today. So that's, in general, the situation. However, as I mentioned, what's most interesting is that they're um, more optimistic than ever before. Uh, they're hopeful. They are a generation. Uh, we should be hopeful because th this generation of youth did what uh, my generation and my parents' generation believed are, uh, is economically or is politically impossible. So we believe that they can do the economically impossible as well. They are the source of uh, innovation for the region. They're the source of energy. They're the so source of uh, hope. Um, and I think today our governments realize that they cannot be uh, marginalized anymore and they, they have to be included in the, in the process of planning and in the process of uh, the development in general. So fulfilling the economic pro uh, promises of the so-called Arab Spring to, to come on behind the political progress that was, that was made. Absolutely. Or 
at least in process of being made. So, um, you know, often it's, it's, when we talk about the youth bulge, you know, to put it in perspective, a number that is often thrown out is that uh, in the next 15 years, just to meet the, uh, the population growth in the region, the region needs to create 50 million new jobs uh, just to sort of stand still. Uh, that's more jobs that have been created in the last 50 years combined. So it's a, it's, it's a daunting challenge, and yet I think it is one, it, it is interesting that there is such optimism. You, have, you know, Israel um, is both uh, part of and apart from this region uh, for obvious reasons. Um, in a lot of ways, Israel can be and, and is a, an example to the rest of the region. Israel's done a lot of things right. They have a lot of challenges as well. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I know your background is often education and entrepreneurship, um, but I think that's, in a way, sort of part of the secret sauce that Israel has had. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I think that uh, Israeli can definitely be considered as a success story of the of the region um, in terms of economic uh, economical situation and growth. I think that some of the factors are maybe there are a few uh, fun fundamental uh, reasons uh, to to grow any economy. I think first of all is the um, rule of law, for example, and uh, economical freedom. Uh, these are th th there is almost zero corruption in Israel. I, I think these are, uh, I would say, critical ingredients in order to to grow a healthy economy. Um, but beyond that, uh, there are some other catalysts for for this process over the the, the, the few the last decades, which are um, uh, very uh, successful educational system, of course, uh, mainly the higher educational uh, the, the higher education. Uh, 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 system. There is also uh, something which is, uh, I'm not sure if it's a uh, truth, but something about the uh, entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, oh, sorry, uh, uh, mindset or, or DNA even of uh, Israelis. Uh, people are really willing to take risks and to um, go for crazy ideas sometimes, sometimes it works. Um, over the years uh, also there was a development of a, a VC uh, framework and system that really now uh, helps uh, to feed uh, uh, young entrepreneurs with, with capital. So the system works very well now in Israel and it's quite easy to, to raise money if you have a good idea um, I think this is quite unique uh, 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 elements in the Israeli economy, and I think that's um, some of the secret sauces. Right. Well, I think that that tracks a lot with, with, with a lot of people who have looked at the, the MENA region broadly, um, say, as sort of the, the ingredients for successful economic growth and what, what lacks right now to some extent. And that is essentially um, one... Uh, policy change. You know, it's often been mentioned that it takes 60 steps to form a, a formal business in Egypt right now. Um, it's the lack uh, or the high cost of business failure, the lack of a bankruptcy code, the fact if you bounce a check, you go to jail in, a min in many uh, areas in the region. Um, so those are policy levels. And then two would be access to capital, something that Israel has very, taken very aggressive steps with the government and the private sector side. And the third area being education, that the, uh, much as we were talking about in the Central Valley, and, and I think the next panel will address, is that the, the, the education that is, uh, it is producing many college graduates uh, is not producing people that can actually fill the jobs that are available. Dima, maybe you could talk a little bit more f about that, because I think education is something that you're, you're really focused on. Uh, yes. Um, I want to start with the fact that, uh, building on what Rassan just mentioned, uh, we had a very, grow very uh, high um, growth rate back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, up to late 80s, um, which led to what is known as the youth bulge, which was um, on its, at its peak in 2005, youth bulge being the population between age 15 and uh, 24. Uh, now, previously, until until the 90s, this uh, huge population used to put a lot of pressure on the education system. So our governments uh, used to put all their effort and focus on uh, providing access to education, building schools, hiring teachers, uh, closing the gender gap, 
so it was all the focus was on uh, increasing literacy. Today, this age group is in their late uh, 20s, uh, early 30s, putting so much pressure for the past 10 years on the job market. Um, so this is, um, this is from the supply side. From the demand side, uh, or from the government side, let me say, uh, historically speaking, our governments in most of uh, Arab countries in specific uh, were the uh, number one employer of this huge amount of uh, graduates coming uh, every year. Every year, by the way, there's a three million new grads uh, on, and new job seekers uh, that are pumped into the market uh, place every year looking for jobs. Um, today, with the budget deficits, with the crisis, with the uprising, um, our governments cannot, our private sector cannot employ these numbers anymore. From the uh, private sector side, um, to a large extent, we have a, a traditional private sector still, to a, to a large extent, uh, with um, not very diversified uh, industry base, uh, limited fields, uh, the kinds of job even that the private sector is able to uh, create uh, are limited uh, for low-scale la labor and so on. So the, the private sector is unable to absorb uh, this huge amount of, uh, of graduates, leading, of course, to the issue of unemployment becoming uh, worse and worse. Uh, the education system, يعني, unfortunately, I have to say that we've been hearing about reforms in the education system for the past, um, at least I remember, for the past 20, 30 years. Um, but uh, we've been lacking, I think, uh, guts because we cannot do cosmetics when we talk about education reform. We cannot do makeup here and there. It has to be a surgical process. And I don't, uh, I don't think we have enough guts to, to, to go there and to do that. And, and is it a lack of resources or is it a lack of... Um, guts. Guts. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> um, yes, because, I mean, the, the education system is an elephant. It's, it's mm -hmm. huge. And when you, when you talk about surgical... Uh, process and you, you're talking about taking it from its roots and you know that will shake lots of things that a, a huge uh, percentage of the population are are teachers or working in the education system and um, there are lots of issues when it comes to education the content is an issue the delivery method is a major issue the management of the school and we've just heard the story how just school management can change all the output uh, of the of the students the evaluation methods is an issue. Uh, the learning environment, the infrastructure, the facilities, the um, teacher's capacity, the, there are many elements involved when you talk about uh, the quality of education. And as I mentioned, our governments were focusing on the quantities or the access to education, but leaving quality and relevance behind. And there's an opportunity today because this youth bulge is, is, um, is, is, is uh, past us. Uh, we can focus on the quality, we can focus on proper long-term reforms uh, rather than uh, you know, just mm -hmm. providing access. Another thing I'm often struck by is um, you know, education. the other side of education, one is educating the student, the other is actually a stimulus for innovation, is the research. Um, Israel has done a very good job of taking the research output of its universities and transforming that into, into products. We talked about Tiva and, and others. Um, Counter example would be in, in Egypt, there are 50 state institutions that are doing very, very innovative research in agriculture and healthcare technology and others, and yet the, the product of that research sits on the shelf because there's no mechanism to actually get it to market. Do you see, see further, you know, by, by putting more resources into education, by building universities and other mechanisms, by making them more responsive, is that, is that also part of the, the recipe for economic growth? <laughs> yeah, uh, any of you. The, uh, our governments have been putting 5% uh, of, the, J of the, the JTP on education. So relatively speaking, that is a high percentage yeah. compared to uh, most other regions. Um, again, uh, higher education uh, is geared towards providing diploma. What we're missing is... I don't think what we're missing is the resources, really. I mean, uh, of course, resources, the more the merrier, but I don't think that is the problem. Um, uh, our, there has to be a reform. Our higher education has to be geared towards 
um, uh, tooling students with the right skills because the biggest problem today is the skills gap. We have an, a huge issue with the skills gap. We have a huge issue with uh, um, uh, people who don't want to work, uh, economically inactive population, and we have a huge issue with, of course, hence unemployment. Well, one, one point on this one, actually, uh, again, it's very difficult to generalize because you've got pockets of success stories in different parts of the region. Uh, for example, uh, Lebanon is, well, ranks number seven in the world in mathematical education and, and science, for example. Um, so you get very good quality education in places like Lebanon. Uh, and in places like Saudi Arabia, there's a lot of effort being spent on R&D. Uh, there are large budgets in, in, in the space of 10 billion Saudi riyals being spent on research with research institutions. And more recently, uh, there were bodies created, organizations created, to take this research and commercialize it in a VC-like format. In the UAE, for example, uh, you've got a lot of uh, uh, spending on R&D and, and development, a lot of investments in, in, in this area. And also, at the same time, there's um, a lot of support for businesses to be established in, in the UAE. But you, you cannot actually have everything across the board in all the countries in the Middle East, which I believe also calls for a larger degree of regional integration in the region to be able to leverage all these capabilities across borders while creating a set of reforms to be able to normalize uh, the quality of education, the quality of investments, uh, attracting uh, the right levels of investments in, in different areas of uh, uh, productivity in, in the markets. But one, one thing that's extremely important is that job creation. And to create jobs, you need to have growth. To have growth, you need to have investments. And to have investments coming into those markets, either local investments, regional investments, or international foreign direct investments, you need to have a certain level of market freedom and market openness and economic integration across the region and with the rest of the world. And for that to happen, you need to have a new set of policies, regulations on the main sectors, more privatization, better education, better healthcare, etc. And to do that, you need to have new leadership in many places, either a new style of leadership or a totally different structure of leadership altogether. And this is ha actually happening as we speak today, and it's a long process. But what's important about getting this change is not to do the change for the sake of change because the current situation may not be appropriate or accepted by the general public, but to change into a new set of ideas, a leadership, a group of leadership, that comes from a background of progressive thinking, from an open thinking, from a freedom-related thinking, and I'm just not just talking about uh, social freedom and political freedom, I'm talking about economic freedom, which brings all other kinds of freedoms with it. Because you cannot have democracies without having an open market and free market economy come with it. Uh, so they go hand in hand. So the reforms and changes that are taking place in the region, we're all hopeful that they are extremely positive. And you can, in every single country in that part of the world, you can see some kind of a change happening to the better. What I think is needed right now is for the rest of the world to embrace that change and support it positively. And it's probably not the right time to take the back seat and watch it happening on its own, um, because there are the ingredients of a positive change that are taking place. It would be such a waste of opportunity to simply let it happen and watch it from a distance without the right level of support, the right level of, of engagement at, in a positive way. And, and this positive way would be to really engage with the civil society, to create the next wave of leaders, to educate the next wave of leaders, to invest in the right places, and to encourage the region to go into a more open market economy system that would eventually help sustain democracies, 
help sustain freedoms, and help sustain growth. Because this is a region where a significant amount of global GDP growth will come from, and many companies in the West in the US, in Europe, and many organizations would actually be looking at the region either as a stepping stone for Southeast Asia later on or as a market by itself that will bring an awful lot of value on investments. So what you're, what you're talking about here is, is very much, is not so much a government to government dialogue, no. but this is a, a business to business, Absolutely. NGO to NGO dialogue. Absolutely. Yo? I want to provoke a little bit the you know, systematic thinking about policies and you know governments and just a little uh, story maybe uh, in the 50s and the 60s if you would ask a kid in Israel what what are his dream what he want to do in the future he would tell you that he wants to be uh, probably a lawyer or a doctor if you will ask a kid in the last decades in Israel what he want to do he would like to have a startup and sell it to Google for many millions <laughs> that's the dream of everyone and my question or my thought are if it's not really starting about dreams and what, what kids, uh, what are their motivations? Are, do they have a, a strong enough motivation? Do they have, you know, big dreams? And um, I think it's equal or important as equally as, you know, um, policies and right. structures. No, ab absolutely. Um, you know, uh, we've got a, a couple more minutes, and then we're going to do about 10 minutes of Q&A. But not to put you on the spot, this is an action festival. So what, what types of concrete actions would you, would you propose? Are there models out there? Are there things that can be done right now uh, to start addressing some of these issues? Maybe uh, Dasan will start in the end, and we'll give every, uh, the other two time to think. Peace. <laughs> Peace. Yes. Look, I think um, no, the question is beyond peace now. It's, it's stability even before yeah. <laughs> peace. But I think the, 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 the immediate action, the immediate action that needs to be taken right now is education in the wider sense. Like investing in education, in opening the minds of people on what actually matters. Okay? I think today we probably need to move away. It is time to start moving away from an ideology-driven um, aspiration to a realistic sustainability or economic sustainability-driven aspiration. The region is full of entrepreneurs. By nature, by upbringing, by culture, the culture is quite entrepreneurial. What is needed right now in terms of concrete action is to channel investments into the right ideas and to educate those who are either coming to power or who are already in power with a manual of how do you actually sustain the positive prospects for your country. And that is basically what is needed now in terms of action. And the, the shift in thinking from the traditional way of governing, the traditional way of um, of, of controlling and managing into a more open society, more collaborative systems, um, and an open channel for investments in the hopes and visions and aspirations of the youth population of the region is what is immediately needed. And that model we, we've seen happen in, in many places uh, around the world. We've seen it happen in Southeast Asia. Uh, Singapore managed to you know, create a, a great example out of a, uh, a, a very difficult uh, social economic situation when they were left out of Malaysia. Uh, and we, we are seeing also uh, similar models emerging in the Middle East itself. We also have good success stories. Bahrain was a good success story. Uh, Jordan was a good success story. Uh, although they haven't actually reached the openness that they, they've, uh, they, they, they need to have, but on an economic level, they managed to create open markets, a good level of competition, a good level of investments that came not from within the country, but from outside the country and the region. So Dima, in addition to, to guts, what else do we need? <laughs> uh, we have opportunities. I mean, the demographic gift is an opportunity, uh, very low dependency rate because 
uh, the age group below 15 and above 64 is much less than the uh, uh, economically active population. Supposedly, our governments are under pressure, which is great. Um, back to Dr. King and uh, the creative uh, tension created. So now there is a creative tension being created. Um, yeah, gover our governments for, for many years thought that uh, um, reforms can wait forever and that time is infinite. Today they realize that this is not the case. So this is a great opportunity. The, the private sector is stepping up. The civil society sector is shaping up in our region. Uh, we're starting to talk to each other, the three, the three sectors, the civil society, the uh, private sector, and the uh, public. And, and um, I'm gonna talk about Injaz as an example because it is a beautiful example that has proven success. Uh, our graduates, and this is a study done by a third party, um, they did the study on all our graduates from year 2009 up to 2012. 89% uh, of them find jobs immediately versus um, non-Injaz graduates, only 30% find jobs the first year. So 70% actually of Jordanians who graduate from schools or are looking for jobs uh, wait for at least one year. And how we do that, we bring together uh, in a direct uh, relationship the, the business, the private sector into schools. Uh, so private sector and academia dealing together, the transfer of uh, uh, knowledge, of information, understanding the actual needs. Um, we have different programs that tackle the issue of skills gap in specific. So lots of soft skills, interpers interpersonal skills, leadership, uh, uh, ethical leadership skills, and lots of business skills. Uh, these programs are mainstream. We manage to mainstream them within the education system. To so there is a class within the uh, school uh, um, hours that is called in jazz class, where we uh, uh, implement all our programs. We focus on motivation because um, it is absolutely very much needed and important. Career development, um, entrepreneurship. Just an example. This year, 75 startups were created by our uh, students in universities. Next year, there will be 100 startups created uh, by our students and so on. Um, and the beauty of it all is that it is all being implemented through volunteers who are professional people from the private sector. People with business experience and background who go to school or students go to the business, um, they job shadow, they do internship. So. Um, they're getting a lot of related skills, a lot of the re actually uh, required skills. The private sector is very much involved, uh, engaged directly in schools. Uh, the environment is being uh, enhanced because, um, just an example, the school adoption, for example, where uh, companies um, adopt schools and hence enhance the facilities and the infrastructure of these schools, lifting up the whole um, uh, learning environment. Um, so um, the model works, um, people want to make it work, there is, I have to say there is absolutely today commitment at all levels, uh, and I'm talking about Jordan in specific, but also I know uh, other countries uh, have the same um, uh, thing as well. So um, there are, and there are other models that work as well. Great. Well, I've been told that, that we're actually running out of time, so Yoav, I'm going to give you the last word. Um, well, I think uh, Israel is kind of excluded from the regional game, so uh, uh, unfortunately I hope that this is going to, to, to change. I think that uh, uh, there is, um, the, you know, business can hopefully drive uh, and advance peace and vice versa. And from my uh, narrow angle, I'm trying to, to help in, in creating business relationship with Palestinians, and that's working very well. I told you about that. Yes. So uh, I hope that this is something that, by the way, in, in Israel at least, there is a consensus about um, the importance of, from the right wing and the left wing, about the importance uh, of uh, building a, a, a commercial and, and business relationship uh, with the Palestinians, so I hope that uh, um, this will uh, really move forward. Well, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> we
so on to our next panel, the future of uh, education in the United States, which as you can see is becoming a common theme among all our three panels today. Thank you. Panelist, and I'll start with Dr. Lillian Laurie, who is currently the Maryland State Superintendent of Schools, a position she's held since uh, 2012. Prior to coming to Maryland, Lillian was head of schools for the state of Delaware, and her biggest challenge now is implementing the Common Core State Standards across the entire state of, um, of Maryland. She's a fellow of the fourth class of the Pohara Aspen Education Fellowship Program, of course, part of AGLN. Second, I have uh, Kemi Anderson, who is currently the superintendent of schools in Newark, New Jersey, the largest school district in, in New Jersey. Uh, Kemi and I worked in New York City together where she was head of the District 79 schools, a program that was designed for out-of-school uh, kids and incarcerated um, youth. A uh, pretty tough challenge in, in New York City. Kemi also served as the executive director for Teach for America in New York, where she was my wife's executive director, actually. Um, she is a fellow of the second class of the Pohara Aspen Education Fellowship and a member of the AGLN. John Deasy uh, is a superintendent of schools in Los Angeles, as you heard from Leslie Linda Resnick earlier today, um, the second largest school district in the United States. Uh, prior to coming to LA, John was the deputy director of education for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and served as a super, superintendent of schools in Prince George's County, Maryland, Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District, and the Coventry Public Schools in Rhode Island. He is a fellow of the inaugural class of the Pohara Aspen Education Fellowship and a member of the uh, AGLN, of, uh, as well as a moderator um, for the Aspen Institute. So let me set the stage by uh, quoting um, uh, former Secretary Richard Riley. Uh, who said that we are currently preparing students for jobs that don't yet exist, using technologies that haven't been invented, in order to solve problems, we don't even know our problems yet. One only has to look at Google Glass and the fact that an iPhone app can translate 95% of the world's languages to know that the world is not just changing rapidly, it is changing exponentially. So the fact is we have no idea what's gonna happen in education in the next 25 years. Uh, but nonetheless, we're gonna make some predictions um, today. So we're gonna start from the philosophical, get to specifics on curriculum assessment pedagogy, um, and get back to structure of our school system. So I'm gonna start with a quote from a speech I was giving at MIT about a year ago to all three panelists. Uh, given by David Putnam, and he said the following, it's tragic because by my reading, should we fail to radically change our approach to education, the same cohort we are, t are attempting to protect could find that the entire future is scuttled by our timidity. So my question to you, I know you guys are not shy at all and you're not timid, where should we focus such radical change? If it's an area of focusing, is it working? And if it's not, why? Uh, or do, should we begin to think about uncharted territory here? Lillian? So I believe we really need to start with early learning um, and childhood development because NEKC did a report, the foundation, about two years ago that affirmed what we all already know is that if a student leaves third grade not reading on grade level, that is your dropout child right there. We, we can look at those students and know they're going to drop out. We're going to talk later about the rigor that we need to in, include in our curriculum, but we have um, in the state of Maryland, um, and many states have, gone to quality rating systems for our child care providers, and we've also moved to kindergarten readiness because um, I submit to you that the achievement gap is not created in the school system, much of the, create, the achievement gap walks in. And those are usually our students of poverty who have not had the cultural or kind of um, civic exposure that many of our students have had. 
we need to really take a, a good look at what is happening with them zero to five. With the kindergarten readiness assessments, we can at least start early by finding out exactly where they are performing and start interventions early instead of letting students walk into a, a classroom and get further and further behind. So we, are, we have something in Maryland called the Judy Centers. It is named um, after Judy Hoyer, who was who is the um, late wife of Congress, Congressman Steny Hoyer. And these centers are um, attached to Title I schools. They are either in the schools or they are in some community center near their school. And it is full service for students from um, child care to Head Start or child, early child care provisions to kindergarten all the way through either the fifth or eighth grade. We have data that demonstrate that this is making a huge difference in these students' academic preparedness once they leave third grade and go through high school. So we're gonna focus on early learning, and that's critical for the changes that we need to see in elementary, middle, and high schools in our country. When we, when, because getting a student college and career ready when they reach ninth grade is just too late. Um, if if th that student is already lagging behind there, then what w the best we can do is probably what we've been doing for far too long is getting them out of high school. We're really good at getting students out of high school. We've got to now focus and concentrate on what do they do when they leave high school? Are they ready for college? Are they ready for career? So the the literacy skills early on in childhood development will make a critical difference in their path to college and career readiness. Kimmy? Thanks, um, and thank you to the prior panel. That was very insightful. So I first have to say it's always a pleasure serving on panels with John, who's the only person that takes business casual more ex <laughs> to a more extreme uh, you know, version than I do. It, it really makes me feel awesome. Um, <laughs> Thank you, John, for your inspiration. Um, so uh, let me actually just make a case for um, the word bold not even being bold enough. Um, in a place like Newark, New Jersey, um, when I arrived two years ago, less than a third of our third graders were reading and writing at grade level, according to an assessment that most folks in the country find laughably low in terms of its rigor. So that's probably about half if we truly talked about what grade level looks like, a la the Common Core. and. You know, we run around and talk about how great our grad rates are at 70%, but New Jersey lacks any kind of rigorous exit assessment. So when you really dig into that, it's about 38%. Uh, and of that 38%, three quarters of those young people came in on grade level and passed a assessment that is, in essence, um, an, a, a standard of ninth grade readiness. So we took them at ninth grade, and we proudly kept them at ninth grade. So. Um, the, and we have much better measures now that we can look at growth and all sorts of things. By any measure, um, we lose one in four students um, from the ninth grade to the 10th grade. We lose um, you know, another one between 10th and, tw and 12th. So take your pick, you know, the, the sort of need for uh, vision and boldness and uh, to sort of confront the notion that the, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Well, I think we can all agree the result's pretty abysmal. And the life outcomes for young people who leave a system like Newark or anywhere, for that matter, um, lacking the social, emotional, academic skills um, to excel in college and higher education, which is a gateway to careers, however you slice it, is virtually non-existent. So when we send a young person out our doors with a diploma that either means nothing or without a diploma, we are, we are creating an economic crisis. Uh, you are three times more likely to be unemployed if you don't have a college diploma. You are twice as likely to be incarcerated. I mean, I could go on and on. So I guess the basic point I'm making is the, the, the need for bold thinking uh, could not be more profound. And I will just share one uh, potentially um, dissonant, if not different, um, perspective. Of course, early learning is critical. And of course, young people who live in um, uh, uh, concentrations of high poverty need additional support and early warning systems. And we know so much about what little people need to get ahead and be on the right pathway. And so we should embrace all of that. Um, but I also served, as you know, the other um, end of the spectrum. We ran 
we ran a system of thousands and thousands of students who were off the beaten path because the system had failed them. And on Rikers Island, the largest mac maximum security jail in this country, we served about 500 young people um, who were between the ages of 15 and 17. And on Rikers, we only taught towards the GED diploma, which for those of you who are not from the US, is a alternate diploma that was invented in World War II for folks coming back um, from the war to accelerate them getting a diploma so they could get into the workforce. It hasn't been rewritten since then. And the kids call it the good enough diploma. The adults, we keep giving it, even though the, the results on GED graduates in some ways is worse than dropouts. And as a result, we were teaching to the GED because we felt great and we could give the young person on Rikers a GED, regardless of whether or not that young person was coming in with awesome academic skills or horrible academic skills. Long story short, we recruited an entire new team, gutted the entire talent system, and that's where I think the boldness has to come in around who leads our schools and who teaches our children and who provides the social worker, uh, the social work support, the peer coaching, and all the wraparound support. So we, we gutted it. We changed it 100%. Fast forward last year, I'm now not there anymore, the school on Rikers Island gave 40 Regents diplomas. And for those of you who are not familiar with New York City, that is a big and rigorous piece. And I say that to say, by the way, we didn't even give them there. They're like, whoa, we can't give the Regents on Rikers. We can give the GED. It's a federal test. We can't get Regents tests out there. And I would submit we did that just by doing three things. Number one, completely changing our expectations of our young people and not assuming that if you can't read by the third grade, we should start building prison cells for you. Two, by having the, the, the boldness to do a very unpopular thing, which was zero-based staff the entire thing. We literally laid everyone off through a very small clause in our contract. I personally handpicked, recruited the principal out of the best in New York City, and he is extraordinary. Um, and we were able to offer him an incentive through another tough negotiated uh, piece by the chancellor, um, uh, Joel Klein, and then empowered him to recruit a team of individuals who shared that mindset and who had the skill. So on some level, it is working, the sort of talent um, approach, which business, you know, got long ago. Um, but on another level, not fast enough, because we have too many young people who didn't get those Regents diplomas and who are falling behind, and we are fundamentally robbing them of the American dream. If, if, I, so, if I just may, uh, Cami makes my point, actually. If we do what we need to do zero to five, if we have some kind of social emotional development opportunity for these students, you probably wouldn't have seen a lot of them in Rikers. Some of them you would have, the social and emotional. What we are hoping that will happen is that we will invest those dollars that we have federal, state, otherwise, at the beginning in zero to five so that we don't have to invest them in a prison system so that the students will be kind of chartered for success without that intervention. So before you go, John, so Kemi, I worked at Wackers Island, it was my first year teaching and those, that number is, is fascinating. Um, after the first year of doing the zero-based staffing, what happens after that would last in first out in New York City? That's a good question. Um, I mean, what happens after there from a tactical standpoint is leadership and good leadership knows how to sort of keep good people and frankly game a broken system. I mean, what happens as you lose monies and you lose students and resources, um, the policies in New York are no different than lots of places, including Newark, which means that you have to right size or downsize exclusively based on seniority, not at all based on fit or quality. Plus, by the way, if you're an awesome teacher, you still could tank on Rikers. So you need to be awesome and you also need to be a good fit for the mission, the culture, and the values of the organization that you're in. And the public policies that we have, um, mostly promoted by contracts, but also state statute, are Byzantine. They are truly Byzantine. John? So thanks. Oh, and Cammie, thank you. This, for the record, is my new Aspen business casual shirt. Brand new for this event. I just want to be very clear about that. Awesome. So um, to, second for context. So Los Angeles uh, has a preschool program, which we run, a K through 12 program, which we run, a young adult ed program, which we run. That's 909,000 students who come every day. About 88% live in circumstances of poverty, most unimaginable poverty. 16, 17,000 youth are homeless, uh, roofless. They don't actually have a shelter. Um, uh, no one looks like me in LA. 77% um, of the students speak another language other than English as their first language, 
We translate everything into eight languages every single day for LAUSD, and every single solitary one of those students uh, wants to be you and us. And they want to graduate. Um, they want meaningful employment. Uh, they want to enter post-secondary without remediation. Uh, they want health care, a roof over their head. Currently, a third is our best estimate. We think it's low. Are undocumented, live in entire shadow society, and every conceivable thing we would imagine you could do uh, with a social security number is not available to those folks. Um, so what I say with uh, all sincerity is LA is America only sooner, and we are coming to a hometown near you, and we had better figure this out. Um, how well we dig this, how, so, so how well we do this and how um, well we stumble and figure that out and move quicker um, is going to matter uh, enormously around this. Um, I'm going to take my cue from our Aspen sister Dima, who's like, guts? Like, really? Just push as hard as you can, as quickly as you can, for youth rights. The system is fundamentally designed, and appropriately so in part, for the adults to be able to do their job and lift youth out of poverty. But the system itself is mostly, if not completely, silent on the rights of students. So if we're thinking about the transformations, they are not just and necessary, how we do about early literacy, how we do about youth off track, how are we going to deal with the academy, which is producing teachers in methodologies for which the students have already exceeded the technology ability for how we're training our first new teachers around this, in content that is already stale by the time they walk into the school. We are talking about the ability and the necessity to transform a system pre-K through 14, 16, if we are going to maintain anything of the American dream for the totality of the other and remain competitive and uh, cooperatively competitive um, on a national stage. So we've thought about the transformations um, in the way that one would think about students' rights being in a box, and you need four sides to those boxes so that those rights leak away. Um, so it's been about negotiations. So like all of us, we live in Union Town, Cod Karen Union men my whole life. I have 11 unions I get the opportunity to negotiate with every day um, in LA. Um, and you think about how do you secure the opportunity to transform the system uh, through negotiations. The second is regulation. How do our governing bodies work with elected school board? How do you pass those policies so that when students who have bonded with, quote, our best and brightest teachers are not ripped away from them in schools uh, it disproportionate. So schools that serve our most neediest and most impacted youth tend to have our youngest staff. So when you do a layoff, 70% of that whole faculty has to disappear overnight. It's a fundamental um, violation of youth's right to stability uh, around that. So policies in terms of regulation, legislation, actively involved at the state level and at the federal level for laws that honor, support, protect adults' rights, and do exactly the same for youth rights around that. And lastly, litigation. Now, in this country, when all else fails for the other, you go to the court and you pray for redress. And we have used it sparingly and profoundly effectively. Um, and the thought of making sure that there are cases for those who are not able to vote, can't lobby, can't actually put money into large packs, but are fundamentally hoping that this works for them so that one day they could do that, their voice actually needs to be protected around that. So that's how we've been thinking about this. Um, I would say that I am exceedingly worried about the cautiousness of this and this pace issue. And I actually think um, you were spot on in terms of the notion that it is about courage. And it's why you get the privilege of receiving an unbelievable gift of your fellow brothers and sisters at an institute like this. And you have to go home and, and actually be out there in high risk for those who have everything um, to lose for that risk. So that's kind of thing of this, but it's really K-16, uh, I think, JC. So le leaders like these make, make me hopeful about our country. Um, so let's get a bit specific on curriculum and assessment. So we know within the policy framework, there's real work going on in our classrooms and, and across our schools. Um, so the, the, the chairman of, of Google recently said that every two days, we create as much content as we did from the dawn of civilization to 2003. So what are the implications, Lillian, for what we teach, 
how we teach and what we assess. Okay. One of the things that we've got to address is the um, learning objectives that we engage with um, students and teachers. So let's think about Bloom's taxonomy. Where we mostly live in our schools are at those lower, those lower levels. So uh, the knowledge we teach them, they comprehend it, um, and then they apply it. Pretty much when we look at state standards across the country, that's pretty much where we stay. They can apply the knowledge, we're happy. If the knowledge is going to be portable, we have got to make sure that they can move to those higher order thinking skills of analysis of, of information, of synthesizing information, and evaluating information so that they can, students can create new knowledge. So if we move there, we are going to have a huge paradigm shift for our teachers and students. So what we've done is move there, in theory. We have developed something called Common Core State Standards, and those standards are the result of conversations among the nation's governors and their chief state school officers, people who run state agencies for education. For the first time that I can remember, and I've been a traditional educator for a long time, pre-K through higher ed finally got together and decided what essential knowledge should be at each grade level along the continuum of a student's learning experience. So what should students know and be able to do by the end of third grade, by the end of um, sixth grade, uh, by the end of um, 12th grade, so that they truly are college and career ready? Because so, Lily, I don't think we can est under, uh, estimate enough the notion that in our country's history, your point is we've never been able to say that algebra in Mississippi and Maine and Minnesota is the same. Absolutely. And that is a cusp of something we've never experienced before. And, and not only, excuse my voice, but not only can we, have we not been able to say that, each state was saying it at a different place at a different time. There was no coherence. So what I would think was a great education in Maryland could be completely different in New Jersey, could be completely different in California. So not only are we deciding together what essential knowledge is and what it looks like, period, we are putting some cohesion around it. For example, math now, through the clusters, through Common Core State Standards, will be taught in clusters instead of these discrete pieces of knowledge that doesn't make sense to students and they don't know how to use it. And the math is not only focused on what do I know if I get the right answer or not, but students will now have to demonstrate the logic behind the answer. It's performance-based and inquiry-based learning. They have to be able to explain conceptually why they got the answer. As a matter of fact, one of the consortia assessments, <clears throat> or both of them, but I'm um, with the Partnership for Assessment for College and Career Readiness, students get credit on the assessment for not just getting the right answer, they also get partial credit for actually delineating how they came to the right answer. So we start pushing these higher order thinking skills. Instead of reading a passage in English language arts and summarizing the passage, students now will be given several passages, read the passages, and determine if there is cause and effect. So we're really asking them to push their thinking to really analyze the knowledge that they are getting, to synthesize it, and then evaluate it in a way that makes sense. This way, when we focus on these higher order thinking skills, this becomes portable knowledge. In other words, it won't be knowledge, discrete knowledge learned for a moment in time so that I can pass Algebra 1, but this is a staircase to a trajectory of learning and essential knowledge that I can take from one place to the other and is portable across. Some people ask, well, why did we just stop with English language arts and math? Because we believe these are the literacy skills that are portable. Um, we have started implementing, I'll tell you um, my story and why I'm so glad to be here with you. Peter has already heard this as I was here last week. Maryland started implementing the Common Core State Standards early uh, because we started unpacking them in 2010. So we were within this dilemma of what do we do? We started unpacking these standards. We know that our students need this to be college and career ready. Do we hurry up and wait for two years or do we start um, implementing the standards? We started implementing the standards. And a funny thing happened along the way as we were implementing the more rigorous standards rigorous, cohesive standards that make sense that some of the best minds in the country, because these standards are based on the highest, most rigorous 
standards in our country, but also those of the highest performing countries. So we know this is the right thing to do. We start implementing the standards. It gets to the year end. We have to assess because that's what we do here. So we have to have a data point at the end of every year to ensure student progress. We gave the tests that we have been given. So we implemented the Common Core State Standards that are new with a test that wasn't aligned. And so what we now have to guard against, and, and Cami and John can talk to you about this in more detail, some people look for any excuse to derail the path forward. And so what we've got to manage is Common Core State Standards is the right thing. We're not going to move for that, but manage the communication around what just happened here in a state that has been deemed a pretty high performing state. So we believe that if college and career readiness really does mean that when students graduate from high school, they have choices, they can go to a two-year college, hopefully many of them will have the early college opportunity that Ms. Resnick talked about because we have those opportunities in early college too where they can graduate from high school with an associate's degree, that they have choices of going into work and or to um, the university. And let me just say one more thing. We talk a lot in education about students going into higher ed and having to go through remedial courses. When I talk to people in the business world, they have the same concerns about skills, about that skills match and the remediation they have to do for even employees coming in on the beginning entry level. So we have um, a great opportunity here as a nation to agree on what the work is and push it forward collectively. Yeah, so, um, so Lillian, this notion that um, are we going to derail this, is that we should really give a little bit of, of time to this issue. So every conceivable, we're, on, we're on doing the exact same standards 3,000 miles away. Same type of assessments. We're at a point where we're asking teachers and schools in the United States of America to fundamentally change the entire curriculum, tremendously um, change the entire way you teach, and change the entire assessment system at the exact same moment in time. That has not happened in kind of the America uh, development of our public education system at one point. It's in a triple point of, of tremendous opportunity, but tremendous consternation. So we're having this deep debate about is this federal overreach? We're having this deep debate about whether we should even using these assessments. Um, and it is, um, it is a point that um, when I think about all of these debates, which are very intense, and we need to thoughtfully think them through, what's missing from those are students who are fundamentally now graduating who do not possess the skills to be even remotely competitive uh, in large numbers. And so uh, the, I think the dilemma we face is how long are we going to debate this while we watch students kind of slip away from us? I think the second thing, um, Lillian, that you raised, which was really important, is that this is also a, an opportunity to really think differently um, about instruction. So we're in the middle of a, um, a gigantic, even by our own scale, um, way once in a lifetime opportunity. We've chosen to give a tablet to every single student and every teacher and have all content in digital form. Uh, which we're rolling out in LA. So the scale, of course, is gigantic, but doing both of those at the same time, when we think about the implications for that, they're actually stunning. So uh, you have, a, we, te we, we um, uh, test piloted these um, during the bidding process, and you had kindergartners coming in to the thing and immediately just opening up. I mean, like, we didn't have to tell them what to do. Um, it, is, it is almost innate in terms of access. And we live in cities with, with profound digital divides. We want to kind of end that piece around that. The implications for student work are very, very fascinating. So we have at the moment piloted all digital schools where there's no paper. And one of the things that we're learning is it's becoming less and less obvious what your assignment is and your assignment, because you are both collaborative working. So actually, whose property right is the final product in terms of grading. And this whole world is kind of opening up for students. And then you have students who are accessing courses online, walking in, JC's the principal, I like my credits now, these are from Stanford. Well, they're not taking them from us. Um, we have a system that says, no, you have to go to room 217 to take that course. And like, I don't think so. I just took this with one of the most profound professors. And so this notion is shifting 
very quickly side by side with so, these. So it's a question I actually had for you, for you, John, and then perhaps we should go into that. Uh, Michael Bobber says that we have an avalanche coming. He's, of course, referring to higher education and MOOCs and everything else. So what's the impact How, in terms of credentialing, traditional credits, traditional schooling? What's going to happen to K-12 <laughs> as universities completely change? We have maybe about 48 seconds. So quick, I'll, I'll go. go quickly on this one, which is that um, the one good piece of news is that Prior standards were developed by having a bunch of third grade teachers get in a room and say, what should third graders know? And, you know, higher ed getting in a room and saying, you know, what should you talk about in English one, you know, freshman year? And mathematicians duking it out about what, I don't even, not a math person, I don't know why I chose that. But um, I was like, wow, in, in over my head on that one. Um, but, but because of they were super disjointed. So I guess one, one um, hopeful piece is um, these are, uh, these are, by order of magnitude, these standards are 10 times better and provide an incredible roadmap because they were based on those key skills that actually turn out to matter greatly in terms of college persistence and, um, and college um, acceleration and also career. Interestingly enough, as the alt-ed person, career and technical ed in the US has primarily been a euphemism for teaching African-American boys how to fix cars that went out of rotation in 1952. It has not been you know, a visionary um, you know, entrepreneurial endeavor to connect business, right? So my point is, th when they did the research on it, they actually looked at all the skills that are necessary for careers, and it turned out the reading, writing, thinking, and logic skills for uh, uh, the first year of your career are as high, if not higher, than college. So I say that to say it's, it's hopeful because it's a blueprint and it's a good one. And for the first time, we have standards that make sense, that represent rigor, that are research-based, that are a pathway to the future, and it is going to force the entire industry, technology, curriculum, assessments. And, you know, we all had a press conference a, a year ago where a bunch of superintendents stood up and said, we're not buying any of your stuff. You all are taking all your old crap and dressing it up, yeah, and putting a, you know, I, I common core. Crap. Oh, I didn't <laughs> Yeah, he said something else afterwards. But... Um, <laughs> People are, people are just dressing up their old stuff and trying to put a stamp on it. It's not going to work. It is going to force a level of innovation and quality products, the likes of which we've never seen in this country. And I, for one, am really excited about that. So we're just on the cutting edge of that, and I think it's really, really hopeful. So, so, we, two, have, so, two we, have, so we have to stop so quickly. Two predictions. two predictions. One is that the high school is going to lose the monopoly on the diploma Bravo. Um, very, very quickly. Uh, and second of all is that content will be constant. Right now, content is finite the moment the textbook comes out. It will be constant. Wow. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, so, so we have a couple more minutes. Go ahead. So <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Be before I make my prediction, I would just like to make an appeal. Cammy talked early on in her comments about being bold. I will tell you that's what these Common Core State Standards are, and we're getting pushback. There are people out here in the main who are trying to derail them. Several states that actually adopted the Common Core State Standards have been compelled um, by state legislators and others to pull out. Um, and I will tell you, teachers absolutely like them because they get to go far more deeply and touch the material in ways that they can really go back in and check with kids for understanding rather than these multiple standards that we have that realistically no one believed that anybody could teach with fidelity anywhere. But the fear is I have at least got to expose students if they're going to be assessed on it. So nothing was done well. This allows us to in a really cohesive way think about the trajectory of learning to college and career, but also give teachers the time to be more creative, more visionary, and dig more deeply into the subject area. So we need voices in the um, uh, arena of boldness, and we hope all of you will be great ambassadors, that these are some really, really good standards, and we need to make sure that our students are exposed to them. So I, I want to touch on two things, three things you guys have said around um, college and career and skills. We've heard experiences about skills gap from last panel to Linda Resnick talking about this and career tech education. And we use the expression college and career ready as if we know what that really means. Talk to me about education to careers. Um, right now the college board we're focusing on perhaps looking at success in the first job beyond college. What does that look like? And we've seen everyone talk about the shift from uh, literacy and math being top to non-cognitive, what's that we for the soft skills, and I hate that expression, um, 
to how you can survive in a job and adapt and create new knowledge from what you know. So talk to me about how the world of curriculum is gonna change prepare kids for, for work beyond college. So take one of the skills, they're not soft skills, so we just, it's non college take one of these skills which is threaded throughout the entire Common Core. You can call it a number of different things. Um, grit, persistence, whatever that item is that we wanna name. This is the ability for students to persist in complex, ill-defined problems for a long period of time till you can able to develop an answer. That's exactly what employers want to take place um, and what they need that. They actually do not want you to be able to tell you the thematic themes in Romeo and Juliet. No matter how well you can write that and how well you can spell that, the notion, of course, is that's why we've shifted a majority of the text to nonfiction text so that you can acquire a sufficient level of knowledge and write to a complex, ill-defined problem and persist through that, which means you need to give teachers and students time to deeply wrestle individually and collectively around this. So you, we were all talking about the shift that we're watching almost immediately is a shift from an obsession on testing and test results to an obsession on practice in the classroom with students. Um, and I actually think that's a pretty healthy thing. So I, um, when I was in New York, um, I ran uh, adult, part of my portfolio was adult education and career and technical education, uh, not the CTE high schools, but the sort of uh, traditional CTE sequences. Um, and in the US, we, you know, career technical ed, CTE, and kids have names for that too. Um, if you just ask young people, they'll, they'll, tell you, they'll tell you what's up. Um, but we had something like 47 different sequences that range from construction to um, technology for business, you know, um, hospitality, um, training for healthcare careers, et cetera. And they, they typically had sprung up over the years from you know, someone had a passion or some partnership or a curriculum or whatnot. And so we took a step back and we actually evaluated all 47 of them on a number of criterion that included, A, is this um, a career that, that um, will ha has longevity? It'll be, it's growing, it's a growing field. B, um, you, in addition to whatever, uh, you know, career skill, it's also accompanied by reading, writing, thinking, and speaking at high levels, which we know is going to be true of 70% of the jobs in the US in the next five years, even by anyone's standards, meaning everyone loves to bring out the plumber example, and plumbers do make good money, um, but the, those types of jobs, and, and by the way, that's becoming digitized and complicated and, and all, you know, they're gone are the days when you can obtain a, a job or a career um, that, um, where you don't need um, high levels of ability to communicate, read, write, think, speak, um, and do basic numeric functions at very high levels. So, we evaluated on that. Were they getting that? Um, were they getting, was the industry growing? Um, were, was it upwardly mobile? In other words, opportunities for advancement. So we, we sort of created this set of criterion. We evaluated our 47 sequences. And literally, we probably ended up with like four or five that we wanted to keep. And then, um, you know, we sort of dared to start thinking, oh my gosh, like what are the next 20, right? Um, so green... Um, jobs. I mean, interestingly enough, right, everyone talks about green jobs are like the new frontier, but you go into career and technical education in K-12 and you like, where, what's the pathway? It is a new and emerging industry, so part of it is that no one knows, right? But also like, nobody's doing it, so we flipped our construction into a green construction piece, and we did a bunch of things that were sort of cutting edge. Our like business uh, Windows course was hilarious. They were like teaching people how to like do Word. I'm, I'm like, you know, this, this, is, this is really moving to the future of what business needs, teaching people word. So we, we, we partnered with um, a couple of, of sort of cutting edge um, technology companies to look around the corner at what are those essential tech skills. Pretty much every job has them. So I guess I say that to say, it is literally astonishing to me, the lack of innovation in career and technical education um, and or, you know, the link between school and what comes next. And what, what I find astonishing about it is in the U.S., for whatever reason, um, that was our escape hatch, and it was a quote-unquote dumping ground for students who were struggling, and we needed, quote, alternative ways to reach them, all of which, for me, are euphemisms for low expectations. And as a result, our programming, our curriculum, our sequences, our partnerships, you know, reflect that poor quality because those are the values that... Um, we didn't commit to, so, so that also is a huge opportunity. I mean, gosh, I hope that like three years from now, um, we're choosing from among all kinds of um, entrepreneurial 
uh, new career and technical um, ed programs, but it's, it's sort of alarming to me that that's not the case. So wouldn't you give uh, Lillian one word on, C on CTE or career readiness, because I know you're doing some amazing work in Maryland. Talk a bit about that. Thank you. The Maryland Business Roundtable has one focus, in it, and it is education. That is what the Maryland Business Roundtable does. And when I moved into the position in Maryland, I was shocked but very pleased to know that STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math education is being run by an arm of the Maryland Business Roundtable in Maryland. Um, the president from the um, Northrop Grumman site out at BWI at one of our international airports is the um, president of the Maryland, <coughs> excuse me, president of the Maryland Business Roundtable. And they have worked with us through the Governor's Workforce Investment Board the Department of Labor, Higher Ed, and K-12 to build out a statewide longitudinal data system that does everything that Cami and John says. It prognosticates what's going to be out there 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. What are the skills that students are going to need? Because just as you heard um, in the previous panel, our business community is coming to us saying, we're talking about unemployment, but we have jobs that we can't fill and we're having to import people into the state of Maryland to fill these jobs. So most of our high schools are partnered with a business partner and a, high, and a higher ed institution to really look at creative career and technical education programs to get rid of some of those kind of archaic um, opportunities that are no longer. And the good news for us, and I, I loved it when Mrs. Resnick said that, a lot of our state, like most, probably is agricultural. And we had a superintendent who was coming to a meeting one day and he saw this big combine coming through a cornfield. And he's like, surely this thing is going to stop. He sees me coming and he had to stop in the middle of the road. It was running itself. It was being remotely controlled. This is in farmland in a state where farm farming has been a staple forever, to Cammy's point. The technology around anything that we do anymore <clears throat> is absolutely amazing. And because we have our business community actually leading us there as great partners, it has been a huge um, financial support for career and technical education. It has been an opportunity to make sure that we are preparing our students for what will be and not what is. And it has, and it has helped us even build capacity because we have lots of folks in these businesses and um, Maryland is, has a lot of great uh, businesses across the state who can come out at 50 or 55 and they want to give back because they have been so engaged in the schools so they're taking alternative paths one of the concerns that we have as great um, as we're growing in career and technical education is as we grow these courses where do we get the capacity where do we get the teachers to teach these courses so that's um, yeah. something that we wrestle with and thank you and I know that you also are combining some of these pathways with advanced placement courses college level courses and universities sort of scaffolding right to two and four universities? We, uh, we have college pathways, a requirement for high school graduation. Um, that has been in a memorandum of understanding among our colleges and universities that they will accept them. Thank you. So quick last word on what are you worried about in terms of the next 25 years um, in our education system? As succinct as you can be. <laughs> Everything um, would be the... <laughs> Two, my, my two biggest worries at the moment are this, our country, in, at least in education policy, and there are much smarter people in this room who think about national policy, is very episodic. Um, we do not actually persist. And I am very concerned that we are demanding high persistence and high grit from youth, and I wonder if we will persist through this for the adults. And the second part of that, very much linked with that is, True education for students celebrates the misstep as an opportunity to learn. You know, mistakes are the entire path towards greater learning. Are we going to allow ourselves to publicly stumble and learn from that as we attempt a massive shift in the way we teach? And I'm not so sure we have a culture of tolerance of adult growth um, like we do for youth growth, and we don't necessarily have a culture of persistence. We want uh, instant results about 11 months after we start this. And it's just not real. And I think those have uh, portend to be very worrisome. So um, I worry, like, 
I worry about lots of things, and you said be brief, so I'm like, oh my gosh, how much time do you have? Um, but I worry, I worry that um, we don't believe. Um, I worry deeply about this incredibly dysfunctional story we tell ourselves, which is that we have to solve poverty before we can create excellent schools, and, we, and, and that young people um, should be doomed to terrible schools as a result of poverty. Of course poverty impacts students' readiness to learn and their home life um, and you know all of the, the things that those, those little people deserve they, they aren't getting and we should be working on that. But I have, I have schools in Newark where you can go to three fifth grade classrooms and see radically different results. And studies have shown that the difference between being even in a mediocre teacher's classroom versus an excellent teacher's classroom leads to radically different educational and life outcomes, let alone a really bad teacher versus an excellent teacher. I have schools in Newark, some charter, um, some non-charter, in the same neighborhood, same kids, same challenges that are getting dramatically different results. So um, I worry deeply that uh, we let ourselves off the hook and that there's something about a dysfunctional conversation that goes something like this. Poverty is terrible, and it is. And I am just as committed to anyone, and my next job may be around that and not necessarily around ed reform or the intersection of civil rights and ed reform and poverty. It is. And it's a, a horrible stain on our country's history, and it's inextricably tied to race. And uh, that is all true. At the same time, we have uh, families and students and s teachers and schools that are showing that educational excellence is absolutely attainable and as a result of that are able to break intergenerational cycles of poverty. But it's the exception, not the rule. And if it can happen anywhere, it should happen everywhere. And I am so worried we don't believe it. And I worry we don't believe it because of deep-rooted issues in this country that we've never confronted that I worry will replicate themselves if we don't actually confront them and if we don't create success at scale. I worry about sustainability. Um, John and Cami, people in the state of Maryland are, are doing some amazing work. We have an administration that has pushed the envelope farther in the, in the present time than any with the Common Core State standards giving us support. Once the states got out there and said we wanted to do this, they found ways to support us. Um, looking at what we're doing to hold ourselves as educators accountable with effectiveness, making sure we have good metrics, um, variable metrics, but holding us accountable to quantitative and objective uh, measures um, instead of just a subjective, uh, I think we're doing well. Uh, sustainability around the choice movement that is going on so that um, the state um, part of our um, educational environment doesn't get comfortable with being the only choice in town, but knowing that there are others who are out there who are ready to provide an alternative if um, students aren't getting what they need in traditional environments. And there's a lot of energy around the work now, um, a lot of support on many different levels. I worry about the sustainability. I worry about people just getting tired um, and frustrated with us and um, moving to another thing. So it is so important that um, we keep each other close and uh, keep each other informed um, and give data to help tell the story of where we're going and where we need to go so that everybody stays on board. It, the worst thing that can happen in education is we start something and it works really well and then it disappears. So sustainability is a huge issue. Thank you, you guys have been terrific. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thank you. Is this on, is this up? am I on? Okay, so first of all, uh, Lillian, Cami, John, Jean-Claude, you are heroes. Thank you so much. Um, this was just fascinating. So thank you not just for a, a great discussion, but I think the, I want to say thank you for what you are doing for the children of America. And uh, if anything, the common theme was leadership and be bold. And what I heard from the three of you on the panel, and I know Jean-Claude, you do this as well. You're leading, you're being bold, and you're being very clear about what we need to do. So thank you very, very much. I want to thank you all. I want to thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're going to continue with another public session tomorrow. It's going to be uh, equally interesting. We're going to start with an interview again by Walter of David Rubenstein. 
Uh, he will talk uh, for about a half hour about the very interesting work he's doing in patriotic philanthropy, and you'll learn more about that. We're then going to have a fascinating discussion moderated by Tom Pritzker uh, with several of our fellows taking a look at China and asking, is China in fact a model for the rest of the world? Uh, which I think will be an interesting and provocative discussion. And we're going to conclude with four of our fellows uh, from four different continents getting a chance to ask Madeleine Albright a few questions from their vantage point about U.S. foreign policy and her views on that. So I hope you'll be here tomorrow. The following day we'll be closing with another public session with Tom Friedman. Uh, this is just going to be a great session. Thank you so much for being here, and I look forward to seeing you all then. Bye-bye. <laughs>